as the world has been watching the terrible events unfolding in Palestine and in Gaza, um, I was reminded of an extraordinary book, uh, which I want to share with you uh, today. This is the book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine by Ilan Pape. And I wanted just to share some words from this book. This book is so important and so timely that we understand the historical evidence marshaled in this book and the origins, the deep origins of the current conflict. So on the back cover uh, of this book, uh, we read this very brief summary. It says, the 1948 Israeli war of independence involved one of the largest forced migrations, forced migrations in modern history. Around a million people were expelled from their homes at gunpoint. Civilians were massacred and hundreds of Palestinian villages were destroyed. Denied for almost six decades, had it happened today, it could only have been called ethnic cleansing. In this groundbreaking book, renowned historian, Israeli historian, Ilan Pape, offers impressive archival evidence to demonstrate that from its very inception, a central plank in Israel's founding ideology was the forcible removal of the indigenous population, a strategy that continues to the present day. Dr. Pape's vivid and timely account sheds new light on the origins and development of the Palestine-Israel conflict and is indispensable for anyone interested in the Middle East. So that's the, the words on the back cover. Ilan Papi uh, is a professor of history at the University of Exeter here in England. He's the author of numerous uh, influential books and he's an Israeli historian, as, a, as I say. Now, in this book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine, I just want to read uh, from the preface, the very first chapter of the book, which really sets the, the scene. This is very distressing reading, but it's based on uh, archival evidence, documentary evidence, which he meticulously notes at the back of the book. All his, uh, all his points and assertions are referenced with evidence. So I'm just going to read the preface, as I say, um, just to uh, introduce you to this book and encourage people, obviously, to, to read it for, for themselves. And it begins somewhat strangely about a house, a house in Tel Aviv. But this is a really significant house historically. So he begins. The Red House was a typical early Tel Avivian building, in other words, from Tel Aviv. The pride of the local Jewish builders and craftsmen who toiled over it in the 1920s. It had been designed to house the head office of the local workers council. It remained such until towards the end of 1947, it became the headquarters of the Haganah, or the Haganah, the main Zionist underground militia in Palestine. Located near the sea on the Yarkon Street, in the northern part of Tel Aviv, the building formed another fine addition to the first Hebrew city on the Mediterranean, the White City, as its literati and pundits affectionately called it. Today, the house no longer exists there, a victim of development, which has raised this architectural relic to the ground to make room for a car park next to the Sheraton Hotel. Thus, in this street, too, no trace is left of the White City, which has been slowly transmogrified into the sprawling, polluted, extravagant metropolis that is modern Tel Aviv. In this building, on a cold Wednesday afternoon, 10th of March, 1948, a group of 11 men, veteran Zionist leaders, together with young military Jewish officers, put the final touches to a plan for the ethnic cleansing of Palestine. That same evening, military orders were dispatched to the units on the ground to prepare for the systematic expulsion of the Palestinians from vast areas of the country. The orders came with a detailed description of the methods to be employed to forcibly evict the people. Large scale intimidation, laying siege to and bombing villages and population centers setting fire to homes, properties and goods, 
expulsion, demolition, and finally, planting mines among the rubble to prevent any of the expelled inhabitants from returning. Each unit was issued with its own list of villages and neighborhoods as the targets of this master plan. Codenamed Plan D, or Dalit in Hebrew, this was the fourth and final version of less substantial plans that outlined the fate the Zionists had in store for Palestinians and consequently for its native population. The previous three schemes had articulated only obscurely how the Zionist leadership contemplated dealing with the presence of so many Palestinians living in the land the Jewish national movement coveted as its own. This fourth and last blueprint spelled it out clearly and unambiguously. The Palestinians had to go. And at this point in the book, we have a note, note number four. And I just want to read the note to you because this is a meticulously researched book by a leading historian. Number four, the documents from this meeting are summarized in the IDF archives, CHQ slash operations branch, 10th of March, 1948, file 922-75-795, and in the Haganah archives, 73-94. And there's uh, further notes and, document and documentary evidence for uh, this meeting in this note number four. He continues, in the words of one of the first historians to note the significance of that plan, Shimka Flappen so, wrote, the military campaign against the Arabs, including the conquest and destruction of the rural areas, was set forth in the Haganah's Plan Dalit. This is uh, the aforementioned Plan D. The aim of the plan was, in fact, the destruction of both the rural and urban areas of Palestine. As the first chapters of this book will attempt to show, this plan was both the inevitable product of the Zionist ideological impulse to have an exclusively Jewish presence in Palestine and a response to developments on the ground once the British cabinet had decided to end the mandate, because the British were in control, of course, of that area at that time. Clashes with local Palestinian militias provided the perfect context and pretext for implementing the ideological vision of an ethnically cleansed Palestine. The Jewish, sorry, the Zionist policy was first based on retaliation against Palestinian attacks in February 1947, and it transformed into an initiative to ethnically cleanse the country as a whole in March 1948. And here is another footnote, uh, footnote six. Um, which I'm going to share with you. Um, David Ben-Gurion in Rebirth and Destiny of Israel noted candidly that, quote, until the British left in May the 15th, 1948, no Jewish settlement, however remote, was entered or seized by the Arabs, while the Haganah captured many Arab positions and liberated Tiberia and Haifa and Jaffa and Safad. So on the day of destiny, that part of Palestine where the Haganah could operate was almost clear of Arabs. And that's in page 530 of the book. So back to the main text. Once the decision was taken, it took six months to complete the mission. When it was over, more than half of, it, of Palestine's native population, close to 800,000 people, had been uprooted. Familiar, eerie ring there, of course, what's happening literally as we speak. 531 villages had been destroyed. 531 villages had been destroyed by the Zionists and 11 urban neighborhoods emptied of their neighborhoods, of their inhabitants. The plan decided upon on 10th of March, 1948, and above all, its systematic implementation in the following months, was a clear-cut case of an ethnic cleansing operation regarded under international law today as a crime against humanity. 
After the Holocaust, it has become almost impossible to conceal large-scale crimes against humanity. Our modern telecommunications-driven world, especially since the upsurge of electronic media, no longer allows human-made catastrophes to remain hidden from the public eye or to be denied. And yet, one such crime has been erased almost totally from the global public memory the dispossession of the Palestinians in 1948 by Israel. This, the most form, uh, formative event in, modern, in the modern history in the land of Palestine, has ever since been systematically denied and is still today not recognized as an historical fact, let alone acknowledged as a crime that needs to be confronted politically as well as morally. We know the names of the people who sat in that room on the top floor of the Red House beneath Marxist style posters that carried such slogans as brothers in arms and the fist of steel and showed new Jews, muscular, healthy and tanned, aiming their rifles from behind protective barriers in the brave fight against hostile Arab invaders. We also know the names of senior officers who executed the orders on the ground. All are familiar figures in the pantheon of Israeli heroism. Not so long ago, many of them were still alive, playing major roles in Israeli politics and society. Extraordinary. Very few are still with us today. For Palestinians and anyone else who refused to buy into the Zionist narrative, it was clear long before this book was written that these people were perpetuate, uh, perpetrators of crimes, but that they had successfully evaded justice and would probably never be brought to trial for what they had done. Besides their trauma, the deepest form of frustration from Pal for Palestinians has been that the criminal act these men were responsible for has been so thoroughly denied and that Palestinian suffering has been so totally ignored ever since 1948. This book opens with a definition of ethnic cleansing that I hope is transparent enough to be acceptable to all, one that has served as the basis for legal actions against perpetuators of such crimes in the past and in our own days. Quite surprisingly, the usual complex and for the for most normal human beings, impenetrable legal discourse is here replaced by clear jargon free language. One of the great benefits of this book is very clear, very well documented. This simplicity does not minimize the hideousness of the deed, nor does it belie the crime's gravity. On the contrary, the result is a straightforward description of an atrocious policy that the international community today refuses to condone. The general definition of what ethnic cleansing consists of applies almost verbatim in the case of Palestine. As such, the story of what occurred in 1948 emerges as an uncomplicated, but by no means a consequently simplified or secondary chapter in the history of Palestine's dispossession. Indeed, adopting the prism of ethnic cleansing easily enables one to penetrate the cloak of complexity that Israeli diplomats trot out almost instinctively and Israeli academics routinely hide behind when fending off outside attempts to criticize the Zionism or the Jewish state for its policies and behavior. Foreigners, they say in my country, do not and cannot understand this perplexing story and there have therefore and there is therefore no need to even try to explain it to them nor should we allow them to be involved in the attempts to solve the conflict unless they accept the israeli point of view all one can do as israeli governments have been good at telling the world for years is to allow us the israelis as representatives of the civilized and rational side of the conflict to find an equitable solution for ourselves and for the other side, the Palestinians, who after all epitomize the 
uncivilized and emotional Arab world to which Palestine belongs. The moment the United States proved it's proved ready to adopt this warped approach and endorse the arrogance that underpins it, we had a peace process, in inverted commas, that has led and could only lead nowhere because it is so it so totally ignores the heart of the matter. And Ilan Pape concludes uh, the first chapter of the book. But the story of 1948, of course, is not complicated at all. And therefore, this book is written as much for newcomers to the field as it is aimed at those who already, for many years and various reasons, have been involved with the question of Palestine and how to bring us closer to a solution. It is the simple but horrific story of the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, a crime against humanity that Israel has wanted to deny and cause the world to forget. Reviving it from oblivion is incumbent upon us, not just as a greatly overdue act of historiographical reconstruction or professional duty. It is, as I see it, a moral decision, the very first step we must take if we ever want reconciliation to have a chance and peace to take root in the, in the torn lands of Palestine and Israel. End quote. Um, that's the book, The Ethnic Cleansing of Palestine. And on the inside cover, um, we can see uh, some remarkable uh, reviews. Um, professor of International Law at Princeton University, Ilan Pape, has written an extraordinary book of profound relevance to the past, present and future of Israel slash Palestinian uh, relations. Uh, George Galloway says, former MP, fresh insights into the world of historic tragedy related by a historian of genius and many other very distinguished uh, academics and leading journals uh, have uh, praised uh, this uh, work. Um, the Independent, the British newspaper on the back says, this is a major intervention in an argument that will and must continue there's no hope of a lasting Middle East peace while the ghosts of 1948 still walk. And the Times Literary Supplement, a very distinguished academic uh, publication from the UK, Pape has opened up an important new line of inquiry into the vast and fateful subject of the Palestinian refugees. And lastly, uh, Publishers Weekly um, says, an accessible learned resource without question. Pape, as Pape's account will provoke ire from many readers, although no, some readers won't like it. Importantly, it will spark discussion as well. So that, there we are. I do recommend uh, this book, a very timely work to become familiar with. Um, and it really sets the context, doesn't it? The historical context, the political context of the current uh, conflict uh, in the Middle East, which we all seeing unfold literally hour by hour before our eyes um, with incredibly dangerous implications for the world as well. So this is a good uh, text to uh, get to know uh, if we want to know what's really happening, the real context of this terrible tragedy. Until next time.